uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's great to be in Dubai. I just got here at 7, so uh, it's great to be here. So I'm going to be talking about central auditory processing. And so typically when you think about the auditory system, we think about you know the ear and we're very familiar with it and all the structures and uh, various complicated processes uh, that are going on within the ear, like the cochlear and the milliear and all the various neurophysiological uh, now, one thing that we tend to ignore a lot of the time is that uh, auditory processing actually involves the brain as well. So the work that I do uh, in my group with my uh, postdocs and students is to try to understand how the brain is responsible for various auditory processes, including music and uh, spoken language. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. So. Uh, this is a picture of the auditory pathway, uh, starting from the eighth nerve, um, eighth, eighth nerve, going up to the auditory cortex. And you know we're very familiar with this auditory pathway, but not a whole lot of work has been done, especially in humans, to try to understand the function of this pathway. And uh, also, uh, we know that this auditory pathway is affected by genetics as well. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that uh, I've done with uh, Dr. Jang sitting right there. Um, on uh, how auditory complex auditory processing and learning can be achieved, uh, and how uh, genetic polymorphism might be uh, associated with that. So uh, the overall goal of our work is to try to understand the basic mechanisms of central auditory processing from molecule to behavior in order to have a comprehensive understanding of the pathophysiology of disorders, uh, trying to find ways to enhance treatments, and not only that, but uh, to optimize learning for everyone. And I'll be talking about uh, three lines of work uh, today, uh, very briefly for each one. So first, I'll be talking about our work that examines stages of neural processing along the auditory pathway to try to delineate domain general and domain specific properties of the central nervous system. And then I'll move on to talk about our work that, uh, that we did to uh, try to capitalize our, on our knowledge of the cellular and molecular characteristics of the brain. Uh, and to develop and test hypotheses about the genetic basis of complex auditory functions. And by that, I mean uh, very specifically spoken language. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about uh, how, uh, a work that looks at the CNS as a network. And uh, when we look at the CNS as a network, we hope to gain a full understanding of spoken language processing problems and treatments. So uh, and in that set of studies specifically, we'll be paying attention to older adults who have difficulty uh, listening in, listening to speech in a noisy environment. So uh, <laughs> let me start off by talking about the different stages of neuroprocessing. So again, this is a, a picture of the auditory pathway here. And from uh, mostly animal work, we know that as we move up this auditory pathway, we see increasing sensitivity to both acoustic and functional complexity to sounds. So for example, towards the periphery, you see neurons that are sensitive to uh, frequency, single frequency. And then as you move up, like for example, the inferior platelet, which I'll talk about uh, in one experiment, uh, in the inferior platelet, we, we see neurons that are sensitive to frequency modulations, like a rising tone and a falling tone. Uh, as we move up even higher, we see neurons that are sensitive to like speech sounds and music. Uh, and the auditory cortex is connected to uh, a, a number of different regions, uh, especially regions that are responsible for processes. processes. And obviously those processes will be involved as we do with speech and music as well. Um, this is one example of Specifically, we are trying to understand how the brain deals with native speech sounds. So in this experiment, we asked a group of native English speakers and a group of native English speakers to process uh, these pitch patterns that are meaningful to Mandarin speakers only. So Mandarin Chinese is a tone language in which we use pitch to signal word meaning. So the subjects in the pet, this is a pet experiment, the subjects uh, were required to make a pitch discrimination uh, pitch discrimination uh, by listening to Mandarin words. And what we found is that uh, there's a left lateralization going on when the Mandarin speakers were dealing with Mandarin words, uh, Mandarin pitch patterns, frequency modulations. 
whereas if you look at the English subjects, you, uh, we found uh, a right lateralization going on. So this is uh, uh, closer to Broca's area in the inferior part of the gyrus. So they were doing the exact same task, listening to the same set of stimuli, the exact same set of stimuli. At the cortical level, what we're seeing is a differentiation between the two groups in terms of left and right uh, hemisphere processing. Uh, later on, we did a training experiment. So we thought, well, can we train an English speakers to deal with Mandarin Chinese? And if so, what would their cortical processing look like? And so this is an example of an experiment that we did. This is an MRI study. And what we found was that after training, those who were, so uh, the subjects were native English speakers, and they were trying to learn Mandarin Chinese. And those uh, native English speakers who were successful at learning Mandarin Chinese showed uh, a left lateralized posterior auditory cortex activation around here, so around Wernicke's area. Okay. Whereas those who are not successful, they tend to use the opposite side of the brain in the frontal lobe area, like here. Okay, so like they were working very hard using working memory and attention areas instead of auditory areas uh, as they were uh, doing a, a Mandarin uh, processing, Mandarin Chinese processing. Okay, so so far I've been talking about uh, cortical processing. Uh, we've also done some work trying to understand subcortical processing, uh, uh, specifically trying to uh, understand processing in the inferior colliculus. So uh, we did um, an EEG study to try to understand how the inferior colliculus encodes sounds. The inferior coll colliculus um, does a very amazing job of faithfully uh, representing the auditory signal as we hear sounds. So let me play you some examples here. So this is an example of a sound wave, what we present to the subject. And after some processing, after we measure the signal and do some processing, this is the wave that we get from the subject. So let me play you the sound. So this is what we play to the subject. Da, da, da. Okay. This is what uh, um, their brainstem recording is. Okay, so high pitch. Okay, so this is actually what their brain hears. So uh, we can do the recording and then we can play the sound, the brain waves back. So this is the brain waves that we collected and then we can pr play the sound back uh, and then we can hear that. For the most part, the pitch information is preserved. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, but we can actually hear it quite well. So the brainstem is, uh, the inferior colliculus, uh, is amazing in that way. So we can pretty faithfully represent sounds and code sounds. So in this experiment, what we did was uh, we asked a group of musicians and a group of non-musicians, uh, they are all native English speakers, to listen to Mandarin Chinese. So the black line here represents the F0, the frequency, uh, the pitch pattern of a particular Mandarin sound. So this is a dipping tone. And the orange here shows you how the brainstem of a particular subject follows this pitch pattern. So when you look at musician, you can see that they follow this line, this black line, pretty well. Uh, this is an example of a non-musician. So non-musicians do not encode the pitch pattern of Mandarin Chinese as well as musicians. And uh, this is just from one subject, one musician, one non-musician, and we can uh, use, oh, we did a number of different measures to try to understand how well they track the pitch. Uh, this is group results. So, so what we found, again, is that musicians just encode pitch patterns better than non-musicians at the brainstem. So this is not cortical results. This, this is brainstem subcortical results. And so now what we're doing is uh, we are um, trying to understand how um, this pitch uh, tracking develops uh, across um, 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 as uh, an infant develops, so we can actually use this technique on babies. And so we've been making these recordings. So let me. Okay, okay I don't know why. So this is the recording that we've been making. Yeah, this, this is not working well. 
Okay, but I think you get the idea. So we can, we ask them to track. So the black line is the stimulus that they hear. The yellow line is what their brainstem is actually tracking. Okay, so you see that you know it's not perfect, but it's around that black line. So what one thing that we're trying to understand is that as we develop, uh, as we develop our auditory system and our language system, do we see uh, an increase in faithfulness in representing this, these sounds in the brainstem? Okay, so that's number one. So <laughs> now I'm going to move on to talk about. Um, some genetic work that we've been doing on humans. So um, we're trying to understand the genetic basis of complex auditory behavior. And this is work that um, we've done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jen. Um, <laughs> so um, this is a map by Brotman from 1909. So this is uh, showing you the cyto architecture of the cortex. And you see that even from over 100 years ago, we know that, that different brain regions uh, contains different types of cells. And we can focus on the auditory region here. So this is uh, around the auditory cortex. So we can amplify it. You can see that within the auditory cortex, there are a number of different cell, uh, types of cells there. Right. And uh, so not only auditory cortex, but if you look at the frontal lobe and other areas, there are different types of cells. And uh, there are more recent studies, for example, by Morrison and colleague in 2005. Um, they looked at both cyto architecture and receptor architecture. And by and large, we know that there are different sub subdivisions in the auditory cortex. And also, uh, I w my reading of that the study is that the, the results actually converged um, to Brodman uh, quite well, even you know, after 100 years. My point here is that um, across the brain, the different areas have different cellular and molecular characteristics. And so the work that uh, we are uh, doing uh, in terms of trying to understand the genetic basis is to take advantage of the fact that we know that the brain contains different receptors uh, and neurons and they have different receptor and cytoarchitectonic characteristics. And uh, from neurons, we know that uh, neurons from brain systems, like auditory system and visual system, and these brain systems ultimately give rise to behaviors. Uh, another thing that we know is that different genes code different types of neurons in the brain. So by taking advantage of this chain of relationship, uh, we can try to understand spoken language behaviors and music. If we start to go backward, then perhaps we can start to find genetic candidates for the ultimate behaviors of interest. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, one thing that we did was to uh, look at the dopamine system. So we know that the dopamine, uh, dopamine receptors can be found across uh, uh, very specific brain systems. And those brain systems are responsible for functions like procedural memory, and procedural memory ultimately have to do with how we deal with grammar in language. And so uh, dope, with dopamine receptors, we know that there are certain genes that code dopamine receptors. So in order for us to understand grammar in language, one strategy is to try to go backward to try to understand the brain systems that are responsible for grammar, and then we try to understand how those genes might be related to those brain systems. Okay. So it's kind of like reverse engineering. So more specifically, uh, I'll be talking about a, st a study um, about learning spoken language grammar. And then we try to understand how dopamine receptor genes might ultimately be responsible or associated, I should say, uh, with grammar learning via the dopaminergic system via the frontostriatal system, which has a lot of dopamine receptors, uh, and then uh, via the procedural memory system, because we know that the frontostriatal system is related to procedural memory, and ultimately we know that procedural memory is associated with grammar learning. Okay? Um, the specific gene that we looked at is, a DR, is the DRD2 gene. So this is uh, a gene that code uh, dopamine receptors type 2. 
And independent studies tells us that uh, if the presence of the A1 allele of this gene is associated with reduced D2 receptor binding in the basal ganglia. In other, in other words, you're not taking as much dopamine in your system, okay, if you carry the A1 allele. So our question is whether or not carriers of A1 allele would be people who are not so good at learning grammar, okay? So let me explain to you the grammar that we ask our, our subjects to learn. So there's a lot of complicated grammatical processes that linguists and phonologists have debates about. Uh, but the, in a nutshell, this is what we taught our subjects. So we taught them that the word, in an auditory paradigm, we taught them that the word vib means dog. If you want to say plural, dogs, you put the ill suffix. And then if you want to say doggy, you have to put the key subject, so key veep. If you want to say a lot of little doggies, then you have to say key, key veep eel. So they learn a lot of words like that. This is a grammar that they have to learn. Now the complicated thing is uh, uh, something like this that requires more of an auditory uh, component. So we taught them that cat is pesh, but the plural form for cat is not pesh ill, it's peshel. Why do we have to do that? Because they have to make sure that this vowel sounds like this vowel. So they change the vowel to make sure that what they hear in the stem, what we call the stem, matches the suffix. Okay? So it's a very complicated, it actually occurs in uh, languages of the world like Turkish uh, and um, like a language that's spoken in uh, Congo and Mozambique. So they actually have examples like that. Okay, so it's a complicated grammar that they have to learn that requires their knowledge of uh, grammatical rules and also understanding how vowels match across uh, the word. Okay, so uh, each dot here represents the performance of a subject. Chance level is 50%. So this is the complex grammar. This is the simple grammar. So this is the simple grammar, complex grammar. So you can see quite a bit of individual differences, right? So uh, you know, for the simples, everyone was above chance, but then they went from 50 to like 95%. That's quite a spread. The complex grammar as well. So that's quite a spread. So uh, when we see individual differences, it's great uh, when you try to uh, do a polymorphism study because that's what we rely on, is individual differences. And so uh, behaviorally, we know that the learning of this grammar here is associated with uh, procedural memory. So procedural memory uh, uh, is like learning how to drive, learning how to play the piano, you know, I'm simplifying, but there are different forms of procedural memory. Uh, but here, we have data independently confirming that the learning of the grammar that we taught them is associated with how well they deal with procedures and implicit memory. Uh, and then we also scanned these subjects and we found that they activated the frontal striatal system. Okay, so this is the caudae and this is the frontal lobe. So the people who learn this grammar well, they tend to activate this brain region as we expected. Uh, we did a bunch of network analysis, I don't have to go into, so, but this is the important thing here. So the DRD2 uh, genotype. So remember I said um, ind independent studies have suggested that carriers of A1 allele show reduced uh, D2 receptor binding. They're not taking up dopamine as much. And so here what we found is that the A1 carriers tend to be uh, worse grammar learners than those who are homozygous for A2, okay? So the hypothesis here is that the A2 people are taking up more dopamine in the system and dopamine is required when they learn the grammar that we taught them, okay? And so um, we scan the subject so we can see that the A, in fact, the A2 carriers activated the frontal striatal system more than the A1 carrier. Okay, so we have, fun, we have converging evidence suggesting that the DRD2 is related to dopaminergic system and the frontal striatal system in the brain and ultimately procedural memory and grammar learning. Okay, so I think I'm doing well on time. Okay, so um, the first set of experiments um, that I want to tell you about is our work that um, 
that we did to try to understand the auditory system as a network. So when we look at central auditory system, of course we have to pay attention to, brain, to the brain and the auditory cortex, but the auditory cortex is not working alone. So this is a um, network uh, map showing you how different subcortical and cortical auditory nuclei are connected with each other. And for our purpose here, uh, what's very important is the fact that the cortical auditory areas are actually connected with non-auditory areas as well. So areas in the frontal lobe, as well as areas in the temporal lobe. Okay, the brain works as a network. And so, uh, we'd like to argue that in order for us to really understand central auditory processes, we can't just pay attention to subcortical and cortical nuclei but we also have to pay attention to other brain areas that are connected to the temporal lobe, especially areas in the frontal lobe. Okay. So uh, in our work, we try to look at short and long distance neural connections and try to understand how they may reflect complex auditory functions. And uh, more specifically, we pay attention to how frontal temporal anatomical connectivity may reflect cognitive auditory functional connection and uh, capitalizing on that knowledge, we try to develop treatments for complex uh, treatments for complex auditory behaviors uh, that cannot rely on amplification alone. Because currently, our treatment for auditory disorders is to put a hearing aid on. Okay. So what we're trying to argue here is that we also have to think about brain functions. And not only do we need to pay attention to auditory brain functions, but also cognitive functions. And ultimately, what, we, what I would like to argue is that perhaps focusing on cognition may help you more uh, with complex auditory behaviors than just focusing on audition alone. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you two examples of that here. Okay, so this is some data that we collected in Northwestern. Uh, from our clinic, uh, this is not published data, uh, but we see this over and over again. So Quixin is a speech perception in noise test. Uh, speech perception in noise so is something that we have to do every day and is ecologically um, uh, uh, what we have to deal with most of the time. Uh, the way that we listen in real life is not in the sound booth, right? So the data that we get is that so we ask a group of older adults who have uh, quote unquote normal peripheral hearing. By normal here I mean um, up to 4k hertz. Um, so and then we have a group of older adults with some sort of uh, some form of peripheral hearing loss. And then we have a group of younger adults who have no loss, no, no peripheral loss. The interesting thing here is that even though these older adults have normal peripheral hearing, Okay, they, not, they don't need a hearing aid. Their performance with speech perception and noise is still worse than the younger adults. Okay, so what we try to understand in the first study here is why that might be the case. Why are older adults worse off than younger adults, even though their cochlea uh, are reasonably matched? Again, so we go back to this graph here. So they may have a decline here, but the decline here may actually explain a lot of their difficulty dealing with the auditory signal. So in this MRI experiments, we try to understand whether or not neurocognitive factors can explain differences in speech perception and noise in younger and older adults. So in the scanner, what we did was we asked our subjects to do a speech perception and noise test. So uh, some of the words that they heard were in quiet, <clears throat> Other words were embedded in different levels of noise. <clears throat> so for example, they would listen to a word like axe. Okay? Axe can be in quiet, axe can be embedded in noise with an SNR signal to noise ratio of minus five. And then they have to uh, do a button pressing, do a button pressing task by selecting these pictures. So axe, they should select this. Okay? We asked a group of younger adults and a group of older adults to get into the scanner to do this task and then try to understand differences between the two groups in their brain. So these are the behavioral results. So the two groups did uh, the same. 
when you look at the quiet condition and when it's a little bit of noise. When it's really noisy, when the words are embedded in a lot of noise, you can see a differentiation between older and younger adults, right? Okay, now let's look at the brain data. So this is how the color coding works here. So if it's in blue, that means it's more activated in the younger adults compared to the older adults. And when it's in yellow, it's the reverse, meaning the older adults activate it more than the younger adults. So you can see that what's happening is really interesting. The, the, younger adult, uh, the older adults, they underactivate the auditory regions of the brain. So what I'm pointing here, this is auditory regions of the brain. Older adults underactivate, but they overactivated cognitive regions of the brain in the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. Okay, mostly frontal lobe like working memory areas, like attention areas. So then we wanted to know if activities here is actually related to how well they do our task. Okay? And what we found was that the more you activate the frontal lobe in the younger adult and in the older adults, the more likely that you will do well in noise. So it's really not about the auditory areas. So those who understand, for some reason or another, to, um, that they need to compensate by activating more of their frontal lobe, by using more cognitive processes, were the ones who were more successful. This is not true in younger adults. This is only true in older adults. So uh, we also did some anatomical measurements. I'm not going to go into it because I'm running out of time. But the thicker your, your frontal lobe is, the better off you are with dealing with speech perception and noise. So then the next question is, can we capitalize on this knowledge? The fact that cognitive processes are involved in speech perception and noise. Can we capitalize on it and provide treatment to our older adults so that they can improve on their speech perception and noise abilities? So we designed a working memory training, which would help. Uh, so working memory training is correlated with the frontal lobe activities that we found in independent studies. So we provided them with a working memory study uh, training like this. They would heard a series of digits, and then like three, five, one, and then they have to say it back to us, one, five, three, and then these digits will be embedded in noise. So they have to deal with this noise, and then they have to do these memory processes. And we train them for a while, so um, their, their digit span, their working memory improves, but kind of plateau. But the important thing is that the train group improved, so the, here the lower the better. So the train group improved on their speech perception and noise ability. We were just training them to do working memory, right? Uh, and uh, we have a, uh, a control group who did not participate in any training, just test, retest, and they did not improve. Okay, so it seems like, uh, I'm going to skip the study, so it seems like training cognition can help improve audition when it's complex auditory behaviors. Uh, we, we're using the same idea uh, and uh, we're trying to, tr uh, to train children with cochlear implants. So after, they were, after they, Im they were implanted, children with cochlear implants still have difficulty dealing with speech and noise. And that leads to a number of different issues like um, working memory, cognition, literacy, and learning. And so our strategy now is to, instead of focusing on their auditory abilities, is to train their cognitive abilities. And uh, I'm not going to go into that study in detail, but we've just published a study uh, showing that training cognition is actually a good thing for these kids with cochlear implants. Okay, just to summarize, so we're trying to understand the basic mechanisms of auditory processing from molecule to, from, from molecule to behavior in order to have a comprehensive understanding of the pathophysiology of the disorders and also to enhance treatments. And so I hope I provided you with um, research evidence suggesting that there are different stages of neuroprocessing and there are both domain general and domain specific processes involved. And also we capitalize on our knowledge of the cellular, and cellular characteristics of the brain uh, and we developed and test hypotheses about the genetic basis of complex auditory behaviors. And also through looking at the brain as a network, not just all focusing on auditory areas, but also focus on cognitive areas, we gain a full understanding of spoken language processing problems 
and we use that knowledge to try to develop treatments for various disorders affecting complex auditory processing. So uh, I can't do this work alone, uh, and so these are some of the people who are involved in this work, including Jing Zhang, who's sitting there, uh, and so, and also I'd like to acknowledge our funding agency, so thank you very much. <laughs>